Hello again. This is Math 2233 coming to you from the College of DuPage. And the title of this lecture is The Conclusion of the Lecture Entitled to Kepler's Laws and Such. As always, please be an active uh, learner while watching this uh, video and fill in any steps that I might uh, skip. Okay, previously we had proved Kepler's first law that a planet moves in a plane along an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus. We also proved Kepler's second law that the position vector from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Actually, I said it differently here. Uh, sweeps out area at a constant rate. That means the same thing. And uh, Kepler's third law, the square of the period of a planet around the sun is proportional to the cube of the average distance between the planet and the sun. And again, recall that we did a whole bunch of polar coordinates because the Earth, in astronomical terms, is very near the sun. And so we're sitting near the focus of the ellipse. And that means it makes more sense to look at this in terms of polar coordinates than rectangular coordinates because we're not sitting at the origin 0, 0. However, when you study ellipses back in the day in your pre-calculus, you learned that you could rotate and translate uh, ellipses uh, to get ones that look like this or this, depending on where the major axis was oriented. And we're just going to, without loss of generality, assume that we have this one on this side. And also notice that the symmetries that exist, so later on we're going to integrate one-fourth of this total area, uh, the first quadrant, but you can conclude that that gives us one fourth of the total area. So getting the total area, we would just multiply by four. And I am not going to spend your time on the video doing it, but the relationship between this form of an ellipse and this form of an ellipse can be realized by um, these transformations. And uh, proving that those transformations are true is an excellent Calc 3 exercise. So without further ado, let's move on to proving Kepler's third law. Now, first thing we're going to do is recall that the rate that is swept out by the position vector is um, the constant h over 2. Uh, and you see, remember, this was uh, from our previous uh, work. And also that what happened was not only is it a constant h over 2, uh, the derivative of the area with respect to time, but in fact, it was exactly 1 half r squared times theta dot, where the dot again represents the derivative with respect to time. So what we're going to do is we just integrate this with respect to um, theta over one period, and we get that a is equal to h capital T, where t is the period, over 2. And a is the area of the ellipse. So since the translation doesn't change the area, or the rotation doesn't change the area as well, we, without lots of generality, can consider the area of this ellipse to be the one we want to have. And we calculate the uh, area in the first quadrant by multiplying by 4. And so what we're going to do is we solve this for y in the first quadrant, getting this. We multiply by 4, and we pull the b outside the integral, and this is going to give us the area of the ellipse. So we're going to uh, integrate this using our standard uh, change of variables, uh, which is going to be x is equal to a sine phi, meaning dx is equal to a cosine phi d phi in the integral. And, um, and we're going to also use a uh, trig identity here uh, to do uh, the integral as well. And so we get um, we get uh, this, and you remember when you integrate uh, this term that's the 2 phi, uh, you're going to get sine 2 phi, and that's going to actually drop out. So this is going to be the uh, constant times the length of the uh, interval. And so you get pi over 4, and so you get pi AB as the area of ellipse, which and you might have known that formula anyway. Now what we're going to do is substitute that value into this equation. So we put pi AB into here, and we can solve for t. And that gives us t is equal to this. And if we square both sides, we get this. Now what we're going to do is use those equations I showed you before about expressions for r, k, uh, a and uh, the eccentricity in K and B and K, we use these formulas and this one 
to algebraically realize that this is t squared is equal to this. Uh, you should uh, do that, but by the time we do all these substitutions, we get t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over gm a cubed. Now, you see uh, that will establish this third, Kepler's third law if we can show that a is the average distance between a point on the ellipse and the focus where the sun is located. Well, so the distance, and we're using c as the coordinate of the ellipse, and, and again, c squared equals, uh, let's see, it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared for, for, for n. Uh, no, it's uh, hmm, c squared equals a squared minus b squared, excuse me, for an ellipse. So we're using that uh, for the distance, and this is just the distance formula because uh, the uh, ellipse there is uh, at c comma zero. So this is the distance between the point x, y on the ellipse and c comma zero. And uh, this uh, equation ellipse tells us that I can replace y squared with this. And I can do a whole bunch of algebra. You should verify these steps. But d ends up being this. And we do have the relationships between c squared plus b squared equal a squared for an ellipse. And so by the time we do all that and complete the square, we have this expression right here, that the distance is the square root of cx minus a squared all squared over a squared. Now, the square root is going to um, get rid of those squared signs, but also this is the principal square root, so it's always going to be positive. And so we do have to think about what's going on here. And it is important for you to realize that since a is less than or equal to c and c is less than a, that cx is less than a squared, so that tells me that this thing that I have in here actually is negative. So when I take the square root, the principal square root, it becomes a squared minus cx over a. So that is the distance. Now we want to have the average distance, so the distance is a function. So I'm putting that in here and I integrate from minus a to a and divide by the length of the interval. This is what you learned in Calc uh, 1, I think, is the average value of a function. Now if I take this a and slip it inside the integral, I have a squared in the denominator, so I get 1 minus c over a squared x. I still have 1 half out here and I'm integrating this over uh, this interval. Now whenever you integrate the uh, odd function x over an interval, uh, the positive and negative areas cancel out, so it's really just going to be 2a uh, times um, times 2, and that was the average distance. So the average distance over the lower half of the ellipse is the same uh, over the upper half. That's what we did. But over the lower half, it would be the same uh, calculation. Therefore, a is the average distance over the ellipse, and we have now proven Kepler's third law. Now, I'm going to uh, make some additional comments having to do with uh, three dimensions and also physics. So anyway, we've already talked a bit about this, but um, again, uh, we're returning to polar coordinates. And But now we're going to say, oh, we do have unit vectors. And now we're going to say the unit vector in the r direction is going to be um, uh, u sub r, and the unit vector in the uh, theta direction is going to be u theta, and we know that those are perpendicular one with another. So let's um, uh, dive in then with this uh, as knowledge. So when a point moves along a curve in the polar coordinate plane, uh, its uh, position can be given by, and here is the radial unit vector, and here is the uh, theta unit vector, and you are points along the position vector, so r is equal to, the vector r is equal to r times u r, and theta uh, is orthogonal to that one points in the direction of increasing theta. Okay, so we're going to take the derivatives of both of those with respect to theta, and we find that um, the derivative of ur with respect to theta, because it is a function of theta, is going to be this. But then we realize that that's actually exactly u theta. And when we take the derivative of u theta with respect to theta, we get this, and that's exactly the negative of ur. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our original equations, and we're going to take the derivatives now with respect to t. And now you're seeing how Newton's uh, notation for the t can help. So we're differentiating ur and u theta with respect to t, and we're doing the chain rule. So the derivative of ur is going to be the derivative of ur with respect to theta times the derivative of theta with respect to t. But that is the derivative of theta with respect to t times u theta by this identity we've established here. And when we take the derivative of uh, u theta with respect to t, it's going to be taking the derivative of u theta with respect to theta times d theta dt. But we learned that this is minus ur. So you see we have these expressions for these first derivatives. And the velocity then is going to be the derivative with respect to time of the vector r. So that's the derivative of um, this with respect to time is going to be this. And we get this doing our substitution. So we're going to um, continue uh, with this then because we know what v uh, is in terms of ur and u theta. So the acceleration, we take the derivative yet again, and you should work through all these details. But when we take the derivative of, then of that velocity expression, we get r double dot ur plus r dot ur dot plus r dot theta dot u theta plus r theta double dot u theta plus r theta dot u theta dot. But then when we use these equations again to substitute in uh, what we can simplify this to is that the acceleration is equal to r double dot minus r theta dot squared in the r direction and it's going to be r theta double dot plus 2r dot theta dot in the theta direction. Now, there's two things that are going to happen. Let's do them in a sequence. So first we're gonna say, well, what happens if we wanted to extend these to motion in space? Well, we can add the third dimension. Now remember, this motion was in the plane, so the polar coordinates give us, in this picture, the xy plane, but z goes up and down, so we can just add the component that is um, z k to the right hand side of this equation and so we have now and these are called cylindrical coordinates because as theta goes around you see this makes a cylinder and so this is going to be very useful for calculations where we have symmetry with respect to a point or excuse me not a point but with respect to an axis so here you have symmetry with respect to the z-axis for the cylinder. So we are going to talk more about cylindrical coordinates, and they're defined here. So we have r, theta, those are just like the polar coordinates z, corresponds to x, y, z. And the uh, vectors, we'll talk more about those later, but the vectors u, r, u, theta, and k make a right-handed system because these things are true. And... So we have this is our position vector, this is our velocity vector, but our acceleration does in fact have both the z component and in three dimensions, and also has this term, which we really haven't talked much about before. And this is an angular effect, and this is called the Coriolis effect in physics. Okay, so the Coriolis effect is an effect whereby a mass moving in a rotating system experiences a force acting perpendicular to the direction of motion and to the axis of rotation. On the Earth, the effect tends to deflect moving objects to the right in the northern hemisphere. Think about when you flush your toilet, the water doesn't go just straight down, it swirls and it swirls to the right in our hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it swirls to the left. And the reason is the Coriolis acceleration. Uh, let's see, moving objects to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern. And it's important in the formation of cyclonic weather systems. And in fact, you'll find that the swirl of these systems is to the right in the northern hemisphere and is to the left in the 
southern hemisphere. That's what this is uh, saying. Uh, there's a really nice graphic uh, in Wikipedia, I think, is where I took this. But you uh, you get that where you say, oh, this, uh, this thing is actually spinning. So this red dot is going all the way around. But you're saying, what really happens with motion? So we're going to drop this little ball, but the red thing is moving at the same time. So what happens is the ball will just drop straight down, but this red dot st spins from here up to here. And that's where you're observing. So you're watching what happens and you think that this ball is following a curved path. So that's another example of the Coriolis effect. Uh, one last thing. Um, the great physicist Richard Feynman gave a uh, wonderful set of lectures, and one of his lectures having to do with Kepler's law was lost for a long time. It was found, and you can actually uh, hear someone discuss the lecture that Richard Feynman gave uh, at this YouTube uh, video. It actually is uh, worthwhile watching because Feynman is a, uh, well, he's a brilliant instructor, and it does refer back to the uh, Hamiltonian theorem that we talked about earlier. And again, recommending that you go to this website. There's some great applets that can help you uh, understand uh, at even greater detail Kepler's three laws of motion. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. May God bless you all.